in seinen vier Monaten und ist mit seinen Eltern auf Tour und genießt das Tourleben. Mal sehen, was in 20 Jahren ist. Marco. <lacht>
these could be like Can we measure up your side? If I could change just a thing or two the level of banter you can expect from me. That's that's about where it is. Thanks. Let's have another song.
next song on an acoustic piano, I prepare the piano. I do, I put um, some blue tack on it. The, you know, the, if you have a poster and you want to hang up the poster and you have the sticky stuff. Is that blue tack here too? The, what do you call that? You know what I mean though. I'm saying, okay, good, okay. Nobody knows what it's called. Everybody knows what it means. Great. Uh, so if you put that on the strings, then you stop the strings and you get this sort of sound instead of the normal piano sound. So what I want you all to do is pretend that I'm, I've got that and I'm just
sounds like with actual blue tack on an acoustic piano. Um, I do have a CD here, so <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to compare. Have any questions? Well, uh, let's let's do another let's do another fun one. We've got a special guest here.
is is uh, one that you may well recognize. And I've just realized now that there's a sort of secret link between the last song and this song. If you think you've got it, come talk to me after. <laughs> it's not a quiz, don't worry. So in, this is a song uh, in which 
God and Noah are dating. So it's a slightly different take on what you might call the traditional telling of that story, but I think the rest of it is fairly familiar. The song is called Flood. It's been lovely having you. We're going to have a little break, and then obviously Emma Hooper will be here to do loads of amazing things. Um, so come talk to either of us at the break.
sturdy, I'm too strong. Think myself's too big for you. Feels like I leave you all small. One's not big for two though. I'll hold up the sky for you. See, I'll be your mountain. I am your mountain. So when I play music, I'm Waitress for the Bees. This is my musical name. Um, when I read and write books, I am uh, Emma Hooper. Don't be confused. We look the same. Um, <laughs> I'll do both for you tonight. Um, the first thing I play for you is from an album of music I wrote all about dinosaurs. Um, and I wrote two albums, one about dinosaurs and one about insects. And um, it's obvious, dinosaurs are big, insects are small. Easy. Um, the first song was Diplodocus, Diplodocus. You know which dinosaur this is? Yes, some, some smart dinosaur people in the audience. It has a long neck and eats trees. <laughs> or used to, it doesn't anymore. Um, that's, that's the first dinosaur. The second dinosaur I play for you will be Ornithomimus. Less popular. Silence. Nobody knows this one? No. It's okay, nobody knows it. It is the fastest runner of all the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not very popular, but still very skilled. And this is a song I wrote about it. Mm -hmm. 
sitting down here. Yeah? <laughs> kind of. Um, I can like, I can sit on my knees. <laughs> like this. That's a bit better. <laughs> there we go. Bit taller. Okay, so music is something I've always done. I started um, violin and viola when I was three years old and always played and eventually it became kind of a job and that was great. But at the same time, I was also writing and reading and um, <laughs> using my music to support my writing, because obviously you get very rich being a viola player. <laughs> um, and eventually, a few, well, as you know, a, a year ago, um, my first novel came out. Woohoo! <laughs> and that was this book, Etta and Otto and Russell and James. Um, the German title is Etta und Otto und Russell und James. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the only part of the book in German that I can say perfectly. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, I can't read you uh, from the German edition because, because it would be funny in a way that it's not supposed to be funny. Um, so I'm going to do a reading to you from the very beginning of the book, so nothing will be spoiled. You can, you can just relax if you haven't read it yet. Um, but I'll read from the English version. Otto. The letter began in blue ink. I've gone. I've never seen the water, so I've gone there. Don't worry, I've left you the truck. I can walk. I will try to remember to come back. Yours, Etta. 
After a while, Otto stood and went to get their globe. It had a light in the middle, on the inside, that shone through the latitude and longitude lines. He turned it on and turned off all the regular kitchen lights. He put it on the far side of the table, away from the letter, and traced a path with his finger. Halifax. If she went east, Etta would have 3,232 kilometers to cross. If west, to Vancouver, 1,201 kilometers. But she would go east. Otto knew. He could feel the skin, he could feel the tightness in the skin across his chest pulling that way. He noticed his rifle was missing, and it would still be an hour until the sun rose. So that is the whole first chapter of the book. It's not a very long chapter. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the book, play some more music, and then talk a little bit more about the book, play some more music, so nobody gets bored. Um, Etta and Otto and Russell and James is set, um, well it's set in Canada and, and kind of it covers a lot of Canada, but the main setting is Saskatchewan. Has anyone been to Saskatchewan? <laughs> Whoa! Oh my gosh! That's, okay, so yesterday we played this show, uh, a, a sold out packed show. We, I don't know how many people were there, like a thousand. Um, that's not how many there were, but still. No one had been to Saskatchewan. Tonight, Three people! That's amazing! <laughs> I'm very impressed. We'll talk about that later. Um, overall, Saskatchewan is not a very glamorous place, not a very popular place. Um, it's a difficult word to say. It's even more difficult to spell. Um, but it's where I spent a lot of my childhood. I'm from sort of Alberta, which is next door to Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, but my grandparents were both from Saskatchewan. And so we spent loads of time there in this place that is completely boring. <laughs> there is nothing in Saskatchewan. There is no trees in Saskatchewan. No mountains, no trees. Uh, like, forget a shopping mall or anything like that. It's just, it's just flat as can be with about six people who live there. And that's all. It's just farms and farms and farms and flat and flat and flat. Um, the joke in Saskatchewan is that you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> um, so this place with nothing in it was where I spent a lot of my childhood growing up. And that seems kind of on the one hand really boring, but on the other hand, a boring place is the best place to be when you're a child because your imagination can f at home knowing that Ed is off walking and not knowing where she is or how she's doing. The phone rang. It took Otto four rings to find it, past all the letters and recipes. By the time he got to it, it was too late. The ringing had stopped. It must have been Edda in an emergency. He stayed there right by the phone for 11 minutes, watching it, thinking. Etta is out of food and money. She's thin, her clothes and her flesh both worn down to near transparency. It has been three days since her last letter, three days without eating. She has resorted to chewing grass and drinking dandelion milk, the skin around her lips turned green. Finally, on the outskirts of somewhere, she finds a phone box and digs down to her last quarter, dialing the only number she knows and listening to it ring and ring and ring, and ring, and cut off. No answer. No quarters left. She slumps into the corner of the booth, crumpled, already more ghost than not. Or, Anna is walking, striding east with ease, confidence, strong and alert, singing in an Ontario forest. Just out of sight, off to her right, something else is moving along with her, around the trees, the sound of its movement hidden under Etta's footfall and song. They continue like this for hours until the darkness between the trees blurs into one and Etta stops for the night, laying a bed of clothes in the cavern of a fir's low branches. The cougar waits until Etta is asleep, regular breathing, and then slips in beside her, always noiseless, and lays one heavy paw on her neck. 
and awakes before the claws have a chance to extend. She pushes herself backwards away into the tree's base. No, the cougar springs forward, catches some fur in the low needles of the tree, springs onto Etta's chest. Yes, you've had a good life, Etta. You're old now. I need this. I need to survive too. The claws tear an even track down her coat, and there is blood. Not yet. I'm almost there. Not yet, says Etta. She kicks out into the animal's beautiful, soft belly. A female, she realizes. A mother. She rolls left towards her things, her bag, and Otto's rifle. The cougar catches a leg with her mouth, just below the knee, and bites down, and the pain bursts through Etta like caffeine. She can reach the gun. She swings it around and fires once and misses. She draws back the bolt automatic like she's down a thousand times with cans, with gophers, and she fires again, and the cat makes a noise louder than it ever has, louder than it knew it could, hit in the hip. It flinches back, away. It looks at Etta, blinks, confused, afraid and disappears. There is blood all along at his side, and she doesn't know whose it is. She falls unconscious. When she wakes, she's in the back of a moving vehicle. You're lucky, says someone, a face that's mostly beard poked around from the driver's seat. You are one lucky lady, lady. Lucky for that gun, and lucky it's old enough to be loud enough for me to hear it from my place. Etta's leg is wrapped in plaid cotton a shirt, red and blue and green. It takes them four hours to reach the nearest hospital over dark, bumping roads. Etta tries to stand, but the nurses won't let her. They lay her on a stretcher and strap her down. They say, is there anyone we can call? Or, Etta has forgotten. She stands in a field somewhere, stopped. She sits down in the yellow, she spreads her fingers against the sun in her eyes. Russell and Winnie and Amos and the others will be done their chores soon and they'll all meet and walk home together. Children should walk together. She sits and waits and watches grasshoppers bound towards her and away. When the sun starts to set, she stretches out, puts her hands behind her head and thinks, any minute now. When the farmer, a woman, broad and strong and tanned, with always squinting eyes, finds her two days later. Etta is still like that, smiling, her hands behind her head. What a beautiful way to go, thinks the farmer. She strokes bits of dust and seed from Etta's white, thin hair. She reaches through the old woman's bag, arranging items neatly in piles beside the body, a shrine, until she finds a bit of paper that says, home, and a phone number. The phone rang again. Otto jumped, fumbled, grabbed it. Hello, he said. Yes, hello. So this is where I leave you <laughs> with the book. Um, Etta und Otto und Russell und James. Um, it's over there in German. I don't know if the English version is there, but um, the English version exists as well. Um, but. Yes, you can get it and read it in German and see how it compares, <laughs> how the translation compares. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, I think, a little bit about the fact that I'm a musician and I'm an author, and even though I have two different microphones, mostly I'm one person, and so those two things bleed into each other. Um, and people often ask me, you know, does the music influence your writing? Does the writing influence your music? How does it... How does it work all together, one person? And um, I like to, uh, as an answer, I like to point them towards the name of my book, which I chose mostly because it goes Etta and Otto and Russell and James. <laughs> what a great rhythm. <laughs> it's like a um, So rhythm is very important to me in, in my writing. And, um, and I think that's, that's one way that the musicality comes through. Another way is tempo. Um, tempo in music basically means how fast or slow something is. Um, you know, a fast song, a slow song. Um, but I think it also exists in literature. I think that if you're reading something by Charles Dickens that has long sentences with massive words and long passages of description 
that's a very slow tempo. You're going to be reading it slowly, like a slow movement of a symphony, kind of sinking in. If you're reading something with very short words and short sentences, um, lots of punctuation, like uh, Ernest Hemingway, then that's going to be a fast tempo. You're going to just kind of go through it really quickly. And I think that affects how you interact with literature, whether or not you know you notice it while you do it. I think while you're reading, you you get pulled and pushed in these different speeds. And that's something I really like to play with in, in my book. So there are bits where I'm kind of trying to make the reader go faster and then slow things down. Um, and one example of that is chapter 19. Um, I won't read it to you, I'll show it to you. This is chapter 19. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very long. Um, so, Chapter 19 makes use of white space, as in like space with nothing on it. And that's, that's something that happens in music as well, to, to play with tempo. You have lots of pauses in music, and that's kind of what makes the tempo and what makes the music what it is. If you think, um, if you think for example, of, say, uh, Beethoven, Beethoven's fifth, it goes, ba 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 if it started, if the whole symphony, well, that movement of the symphony started with ba 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 it's not as interesting. It's a different piece of music. So that white space, that pause, is very important in music. And I feel like it's very important in literature as well. So you're reading and you get, oh, chapter, I just randomly opened to chapter 12, also a very long chapter. <laughs> um, you get to chapter 12 and you kind of read that and you go, <gasps> And you have to take a break because there's all this white space for your eyes to kind of go down. And then you keep going, oh, okay, whew, like that. So I like to play with that sort of element of musicality as well. Um, a funny side story about chapter 19 and chapter 12 is that I was doing an interview once with a bunch of, it was like an open interview with people from the public who could um, send in questions. And one of the questions, one person said uh, that they felt like they were ripped off because there weren't enough words on every page. <laughs> um, so this is a warning to you. If you haven't, um, if you haven't already read or bought the book, uh, just know that some of the pages won't be full of words. It's um, it's not a rip off. That's intended. I'm not just trying to be cheap with ink. That's that's intentional. Um, so this is yeah. This is kind of how the words and the music come together like this. There's one other, well, there's a few other ways. One other way is through inspiration. So when, when I'm writing a book, there's often music that I listen to or music that I think of that inspires the book. Whether or not it's actually in the book, you know, depends. But the next book that I'm writing now um, is set in Newfoundland, which is a, a rainy, stormy island off the coast of Canada. And there are many folk songs in Newfoundland. And so I've been listening to many of these folk songs. Some of them are actually in the book. And um, one of them is called She's Like the Swallow. And it's in the book. And I love it. And I think it, it's inspiring the book quite a bit. And I'm going to play it for you. <laughs> So this is Canadian folk song, She's Like the Swallow. And this is going to be, woo, this is going to be my second last song, um, a penultimate song. And um, I hope you liked it. Um, I hope you had a nice night. I can't believe my baby didn't cry. Mm -hmm. It's magic. <laughs> woo! <laughs> Good job, Larko. Good job, Charlie. <laughs> Your music was great. Your fathering is even better. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, if you if you enjoy it, um, I have I have the insect album here and the book obviously here. I'm happy to sign them or just talk to you if you have questions about Saskatchewan. Um, <laughs> and just thank you for having us. This place is magic. <laughs>
joy. I love my love, but my love is like a stick and so if you look at a tree you're like oh there's no there's no insects there but actually there's lots of them just doing this yeah yeah okay that's the one yeah <laughs> okay stick insect um i had um i had a pet well i had like a few pet stick insects when we have made like four or something and when i had those pets i learned a lot about them i learned that they're almost all female and um and the, the males are very different. They're small and they're brown and they pretty much don't exist. There's like <laughs> one male for every thousand females. And the female, that's because the females, sorry, don't need the males. They lay eggs all by themselves. <laughs> so they lay a lot of eggs, as I discovered when I had them. They lay somewhere around 100 eggs a day. They just lay them and lay them and lay them. And because they have no males, they're not, they're not mating. They're not mixing up their genetic... DNA at all. Um, so all of those eggs produce babies that are exact clones of the mother and that are exact clones of each other. So I kind of was thinking about that and, and realized how horrible it would be, how crazy it would be to have a hundred sisters who are exactly the same as you. So I wrote a song about it. This is Stick Insect. Thank you very much. You've been amazing. When we go to sleep in the morning, I don't know when we go. Your feet are against my feet in the morning, so our eyes don't show we're growing. Our side by side, we were born in Oh, and this is how we grow. 
go. See you. 